And we're going to look at four verses this morning, uh, six, seven, uh, I guess it's five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. So we'll read from uh, First Thessalonians 3, 6 to 10. This morning, as we uh, celebrate the Lord's table, that uh, typically I will uh, preach a shorter message, and then we'll go to the celebration of the Lord's table. And uh, so welcome, welcome to our sermon series, Think Inside the Book, from First Thessalonians, and the title of the messages are Strength for the Battle. And so let's read this morning how the, uh, and, and look at how the, um, the Thessalonians went through quite a bit. And they were strengthened for the battle. And so this morning, we're going to look at how that strength was found in the unity of the church, the love of the brethren, uh, powerful prayer, and a dependence on God that defeats the enemy's tactics. And so that's what we can see here this morning in these five verses. Verse 6 says, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love, and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted, comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God as we pray most earnestly night and day, that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. And so always remember uh, that Paul, uh, speaking uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit from God the Father, is always looking for a little bit more from us. Uh, never looking for us to, to come to the place where there's a, a complacency uh, in our faith, in our walk, in our growth, uh, and always measuring ourselves against the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never measuring ourselves against one another, because when we do, it always gives us reason to do less. Well, at least I'm not Bowman. At least I'm not Black, you know, and, and that's not how God wants us to look at it. He wants us to measure ourselves against Christ. And, and, and Paul wants from the Thessalonians, who, by the way, as we have read, are doing great. He wants more and more. He always is looking for more and more. And so verse 6, Paul has uh, gone to Athens, Timothy has gone off back to Thessalonica to get a report to find out what's going on over there so he can bring that news back to Paul because remember they were chased out of town and uh, and I think Paul has had it on his heart ever since that uh, maybe he resented and had a little genuine, uh, can I say godly uh, regret that he had to leave there and and, uh, and not be able to finish the work he had begun with them and, and not have the time that he wanted to spend with them. And so he's, he's dying to hear from them. And so Timothy goes to visit, comes back to Athens, and brings back this, this glowing and wonderful report. And so in verse 6, we read, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith. And the good news there is not the gospel good news, but it is kind of the gospel good news. And, and, and I think it's play on words here where he's saying, you know, it's, it's really good news that they're saved and growing, right? The good news of your faith and love and and reported that you always remember us kindly, and you long to see us as we long to see you. And so, in this context, you got to remember what the Thessalonians were going through. You got to remember what they had turned from. They had turned from the idols, and 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 uh, probably had uh, caused disputes and and difficulties with family and friends and and neighbors who were worshiping all the idols of the uh, of Thessalonica and. And so they had uh, given that all up and they had turned to the living God. And, and then there was all these false teachers that were in town and that were uh, teaching them and, and trying to, uh, trying to, you know, dissuade them from following Christ and moving away. But in this verse, if I can say it this way, we have an opportunity to overhear a conversation that's going on. Kind of a three-way conversation between Paul and Timothy and, and, the, and the Thessalonians. Uh, and if we listen close enough, we can discern the dynamics uh, and, and capture some of the elements of the conversation that, 
that have been going on. Kind of like when you're home and, and, and your spouse gets a phone call and you're not really eavesdropping, but you can overhear, you know, at least one side of the conversation. And based on what that one person is saying, you can kind of understand what the other person is, right? Uh, you can tell a little bit of what's going on. And so the things that Paul brings up and the things that, that Paul talks about here from his side of the conversation uh, and what Timothy brings back uh, from the Thessalonians side of the conversation, it gives us a little more insight into what's what's going on. So there's this good report. There's a, a fondness that they have for one another. It would have been devastating if Paul if Timothy had come back and said, you know, they're done. <laughs> that 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 plant died and uh, and, and they kind of they're upset with what you taught them. I mean, that would have been awful, right? And so this 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 mutual longing for one another to see one another face to face, you know, gives us uh, some insight into the into the relationship they had with one another, right? The, the relationship that we've talked about uh, all through chapter two, and uh, you know that they were they were his children and they were his uh, he was their father and and then were and then they were brethren. And they were those who, and like a charger, a father, he charged them to grow and to continue to change. And so their faith and their love, uh, it, it's its certainly referring to the doctrine, you know, the, the right teaching that Paul had given to them. They were incorporating that into their lives. You know, the, the some of the horrible and really awful things that take place in the false teaching of that day and the worship of idols of that day. You know, if you do a little bit of reading and look into the background of some of those um, celebrations and ceremonies and rituals was pretty awful, uh, you know, compared to the, to the holy and righteous God that we serve. Uh, Paul called it uh, an, an impurity, let's say, in uh, chapter two, remember? He said it was error, it was impurity, and, and it was deceitful. And, and so because of their genuine faith, their genuine love, it's incorporating itself into their life. Uh, they, they're loving and they're caring for one another in ways that they had never done before. Uh, the world looks at that, that world of that day, and I think our world of this day, looks at that as kind of a weakness. And even a weakness that can be exploited and taken advantage of. You know, as, as in like sometimes some people will come into the church because they, they, they think we're foolish and we're Christians and we love one another and we help one another. And they, and they just decide to come in and, and drain all that they can, you know, out of a local church. You know, get, uh, get what they can out of it and then leave and go to the next. Uh, these guys really genuinely they cared for one another and they had a faithfulness and a love for God that was evident to Timothy. And so in, in that sense, the plans of the devil, Satan's plans, they're thwarted. He loses this battle. Praise God. You notice that what, what we've seen so far is that his tactics here are to keep them from one another. Right? Paul said, I, I wanted to come back time and time again, but Satan hindered us. Right. And then he says over here, we're not um, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would have been in vain. And, and so, you know, keep the, the believers from one another, keep them uh, from God, keep them from worship, do everything he can to disrupt and distract and 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 disturb and bring division, you know, to the local church. He lost. Another tactic he was using was to bring the false teachers in uh, to cause division, to in embitter the believers towards one another. Well, that church, and I can say this, like this church, uh, didn't fall for that. You know, they, they, they stood up to that. And again, Satan lost round two of that battle in the church of Thessalonica. And so remember what they were going through. They said, Paul said, it's neither, remember in chapter two, we said they went through much, chapter one rather, much affliction. In chapter two, he said they, it was much conflict. He, he, he said there were, there were many sufferings. There was error. There was impurity. Uh, there were attempts to deceive. None of that 
have moved these believers. And so Satan lost that battle. Strike three. It, it, instead, we hear, we hear things like, you always remember us. And you think kindly of us. And you long to see us as much as we long to see you. And so whatever the gossip was, we can we can have an idea as we face that in our own lives and, and, and in churches and things like that. You know, but whatever the gossip was, whatever the, the slander was, whatever the malicious things that were being said about Paul and about his team, they didn't work. It did not work in these believers. They were able to see through it and stand fast. And I just want to say something again about a faithful messenger. You know, Timothy was given an assignment to go and, and get a report and bring it back. And, and Paul was on edge the whole time. And Timothy knew that. He was a faithful messenger. Proverbs and scripture has a lot to say about a faithful messenger. You know, Proverbs 25, 13 says that, that a faithful messenger is like snow in harvest. It, it brings a refreshment. You know, it's cool and refreshing. And so you say, well, what does snow have to do with harvest? Well, it, it shouldn't be there, but when you're out working in the hot sun, and you've been working in the hot sun all day, and maybe it starts to snow, you, you, you know, you're not really going to complain about that. That's cool and refreshing. And so Paul says that's cool and refreshing to hear from Timothy. Verse 7 says, for this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. And one of the commentaries that I referred to said this, how have modern health, wealth, and prosperity preachers, have they ever read these texts? <laughs> have they ever read when Paul said these things throughout the New Testament? All the difficulties, all the conflict within and without the church, all the beatings, all the shipwrecks, all the hunger, all the concern, all the difficulties that Paul had, the imprisonments and the, and, and the stripes and all those things. Have they ever read that? And, you know, we have a constitution, we have a bill of rights. You know, our forefathers built a Christian culture into this new country. And so now we can all sit back and relax and wait for Christ to come and get us? Uh, I, I think we can look at culture and see that's not working. Right? That's, that's not working. You know, perhaps one of <clears throat> Satan's deceitful schemes is just to make us think that we have won the battle. You know, that the battle's over. And yet it's not. It's raging. He has certainly convinced a lot of preachers and a lot of Christians of that particular lie. I praise God the faithful here at River Bible Church don't believe that, but that you all stand fast and you're proclaiming the true gospel, even to many who don't want to hear it and, and, uh, and reject it. The gospel is going forth and the gospel is being preached in the Beverly area, and I praise God for that. Paul says our distress and affliction. You know, in the midst of all this uh, distress and affliction, he said, he says, when I heard that report, it was like it just all went away. You know, all the pressure, all the tension, all the all the uh, all the tough stuff. It just it just went away when I heard that. It's like they're not even there. You know, uh, when we hear this, the comfort that it brings that you are living your faith. I had the opportunity to uh, close out a uh, some counseling I've been doing with a young couple that really have heard. God's word and 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 as I was talking to them on Friday, um, I was thinking I had been studying this verse. And I was thinking about what he was saying, and I thought, oh, I get that. You know, I, I get what he's saying. You know, all the difficulties of ministry, all the all the uh, stuff. It just in that moment while I was talking to them, and their lives are changing, and they're praising God for what they've learned and how they're going to move forward with it, and, and even teach others about it. It was just it's all worth it, you know, man, all the stress and tension and, and distresses and all those things, they just go away, you know, for that moment while you're, you know, for those minutes while you're having that conversation, it just lifts you up. It's just so comforting. I think I've told you before, I have my encouragement envelope in my desk of letters and cards and things that I've gotten in the past. And 
when things get tough, sometimes I just sit back, open the drawer, pull out that envelope, and I start reading. <laughs> you know, I start reading some of those things, and it's like, wow, it's, it's still worth it. It's still worth it, you know? And that's what Paul's saying. It's, it's, it's so worth it when the, all the distress, all the anguish, all the conflict, all the difficulty, they just disappear when, when someone begins to change and grow in Christ. How it is, how important is it to rejoice that others are living a godly lifestyle? You know, uh, and, and we need that rejoicing. We need that joy. We need that comfort. We need that recognition, you know, that praise and that encouragement from one another because we're not going to get it from anybody else, right? Let another man praise you, right? We know that. Praise God that, that when we hear about the, the good things that are happening in other churches and other ministries, especially through our mission program, you know, that people are getting saved and people are changing and growing and, and uh, things are happening. Praise God, there's, there's no sense of jealousy, you know, when you hear of a, a good report from others. Praise God, there's no indifference towards that. But that is, it, it's exciting and we want to hear those things and, and we're a part of those things that are happening around the world, you know, through our missions program. And so sometimes, folks, when the, when serving the Lord just seems to get ridiculously tough, you know, and, and you just want to give up, don't. You know, just, just remember the good work that God has done, the good things that God has done through you in the lives of others and for his glory and, and, and in his praise. And, and he says here in this verse, we were comforted in all our distress and affliction. We have been comforted about you and the word comforted here is the word that's used for the holy spirit it's used for the work of jesus christ in us in john 14 and and so um paul is trying to say you know with this word that that's simply packed with so much meaning it's really hard to express the fullness of joy that comes out of this word in english it's like a like a baby trying to express uh, to its mother, the comfort that it's receiving as it's being carried and kept warm and fed, and you know what I mean. It just the baby really doesn't even know how to express it. It's just so awesome. And in verse eight, he says, "For now we live." Think about that. For now we live. You hear, when I hear when he when I read that you know a few times over and over I began to hear him say it was killing me, you know he says because now we live, you know not knowing what was going on it was it was killing me, but now we live since you are standing fast in the Lord, and remember what they have stood up against it wasn't easy going for them. You can hear the relief. You, you can hear the tension draining away in, in this moment. It's like this, this instant mini vacation for, for Paul as all, the, as all that drains away and, and that sense of relief takes over. It, it, it's like he's saying it would kill us to hear anything less. You know, my life depends on your faith, your growth. So it, it's a bit of hyperbole. But, you know, uh, from it, you get the understanding of his passion for people, his passion for ministry and God's glory. If you, if you are standing fast in the Lord. And, and just to give you, a, a, again, a sense of the background of what's going on, the word standing fast is a military term. It means that, that you, you're surrounded by the enemy and they are rushing on and they're attacking and you refuse to retreat. You stand. And you fight. You bring the fight to the enemy. You refuse to give up. You refuse to give ground. And that's that's the language Paul's using for these folks. These guys were committed. They were loyal. They made themselves available. And most of all, they were servants. You know, before you can be a good leader, you have to be a good follower. Before you can before you can be a good leader, you have to be a good servant. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. We have to remember, and I, I think I said it to someone this week, that everything we do, you know, the first thing we have to remember is we're doing it for God. 
primarily, you know, before anything else, was doing it for God. In verse 9, he says, For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? You hear what he's saying? I don't even have words. I don't even have words for what's going on here right now. I, I don't know how to express the joy that I have for your faith. I'm speechless. And, you know, we all know Paul's life was, as I mentioned earlier, Paul's life was one of suffering and affliction and, and imprisonment and pain and stoning and hunger and stress and pressure within the church and without. And this is one of his moments of absolute joy. And he knows that there's nothing he can say that's adequate enough to express what's going on in this moment. He just doesn't have the words. And so what does he do? He says, we pray. We pray. Paul's constant reference to prayer. The, the engine that drove his ministry. The fuel that got him from one moment to the next. I don't even know what to say. I don't know how to say it. I can't express myself to you, but I can pray. most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply and here it is again what is lacking in your faith you know you're awesome you're wonderful you're growing and I want to come and, and, and get more out of you for God <laughs> constant reference to prayer the lifeblood of his ministry and their growth some of the terms that Paul used when it comes to prayer, he's, again, that word constant. Uh, he says, uh, everywhere. Where do you pray? Everywhere. When do you pray? Always. How often do you pray without ceasing? It, it, it's about, for Paul, remembering uh, what others have done. Remember, that's how he opened the book. Uh, we give thanks to God always for you all, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith. And leave. Maybe there's nothing you can do in a particular moment for the Lord, you know, but you can pray. You can pray about what others are doing. You know, you can pray some energy into their ministry and into their life and, and, and praise God and thank God for them. He prayed about things like how they have grown. He, he prays about what God has done in their life. And if you have a problem like Paul did, with pride that's memorialized in 2 Corinthians 12 and other places. Then to put off pride, you put on thanksgiving. You put on gratefulness. You put on appreciation. You give accolades to others and you give the glory and the credit to God. You give the praise to others who have genuinely done something worthy of praise. You give them the credit. to anyone who's living a life worthy of praise. So that's what Paul did. When he, when he had no words, he would just talk to God. He says, we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face. And again, you know, I've talked about it a couple of times now, but all those months we couldn't get together, we're just doing it on, on the, uh, you know, online. We, we praise God for it, but it was nothing like being together, right? right. Nothing like being together. And he wanted more from them. And, and he wanted more from them for God. Not for himself. You know, remember, he would plant these churches. He would give everything he had and he would move on. It wasn't for him. You know, it was for God and it was for them. So remember, cracks and leaks are exposed under pressure. Our inner man is exposed under pressure. You know, what we really think, what we really want, what we really believe is exposed under pressure. Well, under pressure, these guys excelled. They excelled without Paul being there. Paul didn't have to be there. God was there. The Holy Spirit was there. 
And so they excelled under pressure. And so the reason was not, I mean, the pressure was not a reason for them to fail. They handled the pressure, they excelled under the pressure, and they grew under the pressure. So one of the ways we can stay close to God, you know, one of them is walking in the light. And remember, when we walk in the light, then things get exposed. The closer we get to the light, the, the, the more things get exposed. And so we go to the Lord's table where we get silent before God. We ask him to search our hearts so that we can confess those things that he reveals to us, things that have offended him, things that need to change in our lives. And we trust and we believe the fullness of the work that Christ has done in his death, burial, and resurrection. And we believe our Lord and Savior when he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We believe it. And so we take that time to sit quietly and to think and to bring it before the Lord as the Holy Spirit reveals it to us. And we celebrate all that Christ has done on the cross for us. And we celebrate looking forward to his coming again. So this will conclude our sermon for today here at RBC. As we turn to the Lord to celebrate the Lord's table, we hope that you have enjoyed today's message and you'll enjoy it, uh, and you'll join us again next week. And I wanted to say, if you have any questions or comments or concerns or anything that we'd like to talk about, please call the office. We'll set up an appointment and we'll be happy to talk to you. God bless you. And I hope you continue to enjoy the rest of your holiday weekend.